Good morning. Donna, are you there? Yes. Hi, Good I can time. see. I, I see that you're, uh, looks like your camera's on, but I can just see your desk. So I wasn't oh. sure if you were there or not. Let's see what camera it's using. <laughs> oh, Robin's here. Hi, Robin. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. It's great to see you. Yeah, you too. So glad you could make it. Me too. On time this time. <laughs> Yay. Well, that's okay. Oh, there, there we go. I can see you, Donna. Hey. I just, not that I, you had to turn the camera, but I just want to let you know just in case you didn't know. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you guys can make it live. That's awesome. That is awesome. All right. Well, this is the 120, 140, 160 class. So we're going to start off today. I have some one stroke briefs. So most of these you've learned in theory. And, uh, I will be, I will just go through them and uh, jot down anything that you have questions about. And then after class, um, we can go through, like if you hear a brief and you're, you can't remember how it's, uh, how it's phrased, then just ask me and uh, then we'll, we'll answer all those at the end of class and, uh, and any questions you may have. So we'll start off with uh, some, some different, uh, Briefs and phrases, we'll do some drills, then I've got some material for literary jury charge, and then lots of Q&A. Okay, all right. So we'll get started. So I'll mute everybody. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Here we go. Everyone ready? Order already, collect, between, general, program, any, importance, different, go, investigate, April, together, percent, anything, opportunity, they, direction, January, correction, Strength, certainly, wrote, only, progress, convenient, present, from, suggest, continue, Thursday, all right, recommend, therefore, connection, question, also, someone, America, somebody, change, purchase, Upon, amount, Sunday, follow, above, unless, city, employment, handle. All right. Now I've got my next drill. It's going to focus on one word or two. Like I always say in theory, you can usually, you, you can usually tell when it's an article A because of the A sound as opposed to a word that starts with an A where it tends to be um, spoken more of a, uh, you know, like a cute kitten and then versus a cute. Okay. All right. So here are your sentences. Ready? A cute kitten has an acute case of cat fever. Please mark a cross on this drawing to show where he went across the street. They reached an accord on the price of a cord of wood. He is a ward of the court and cannot spend his award. Fred bought a side of beef and set it aside for the winter. I assure you that Fleet Lady in the fifth race is a sure thing. He wanted to buy a Ford convertible, but he couldn't afford it. He said that a round trip to work is about 10 miles if he goes around the lake. 
All right. Moving right into words that have the final NT ending. All right. <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> I've got allergies today, so you'll have to excuse me if I sneeze a few times. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here are your sentences. Ready? We hope that the new assignment will bring some improvement. Check the endorsement on each check. No replacement of a lost check can be made. What inducement can we offer to get greater achievement? We don't want any resentment over the new rules for proper deportment. This is not a punishment and should not place you in a predicament. That is an important element. Give me a moment. Is the cement hard yet? I know they will make an adjustment. The controls are in the basement of the tenement. Grace is suffering from some new ailment. She is living in a retirement home. The monument was to honor John's achievement. Stop fomenting trouble. All right, moving right into names and spellings. These are names with uh, different mortgage companies. Okay, here we go, ready? Renee Ruiz, R-U-I-Z. Home Point Financial. Chris Lyon, L-Y-A-N. George Mason Mortgage. Tara Flynn, F-L-I-N-N. Fairway Independent Mortgage. Robert Getz, G-E-T-Z. Home Bridge Financial Services. Tom Rydberg, R-Y-D. B-E-R-G, Draper and Kramer Mortgage. Arthur Saganda, S-A-G-A-N-D-A, -A -A, Loan Depot. Ralph Noble, N-O-B-L-E, Draper and Kramer Mortgage. Natalie Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, Movement Mortgage. Brian Weeder. W-E-E-D-E-R, Loan Depot. Doug Fry, F-R-Y, George Mason Mortgage. Becky Sheets, S-H-E-E-T-S, -E -E Fairway Independent Mortgage. Angie Schur, S-H-E-R-E-R, -E -R, Leader One Financial Corporation. William H. Farrell. F-E-R-R-I-L-L, -L, Eagle Bank. Thomas Lee, L-E-E, -E, Loan Depot. Eric Shimani, S-H-I-M-O-N-I, Caliber Home Loans. Matt Shirley, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y. Uh, Academy Mortgage. Deborah Metzger, M-E-T-Z-G-E-R, Guaranteed Rate. Ryan Hart, H-A-R-T, New American Funding. Andrew Sidden, S-I-D-D-O-N, George Mason Mortgage. Brandy Alder, A-L-D-E-R, On Q Financial. John Steph Stefan, S T E F F A N, First Choice, Michael Adams, A D A M S, McLean Mortgage. All right. Now a number drill. All right. This is uh, monthly water rates and service charges. Here we go, ready? Residential water rates, indoor use, current rate, 
$2.27. Outdoor use, $8.76. Inefficient use, $4.38. Excessive use, $6.32. Irrigation water rates, outdoor use, $3.86. Inefficient use, $5.56. Excessive use, $9.90. Interagency wholesale water rates, Tier 1, $2.43. Tier 2, $3.95. Tier 3, $5.07. Recycled water rates, outdoor use, $9.36. Inefficient use, $4.01. Excessive use, $5.42. Non-water budget water rates, commercial, industrial, institutional, $3.77. Hydrant, $5.38. <clears throat> All right, I've got some consonant compounds. And uh, this focuses on initial GL. Okay, GL. Ready? All the glory gleaned from the glossary glowered. The globe glittered from the glazed Clothing. The globe trotters were in their glory as they glanced around. Having glandular fever makes your eyes glassy and glossy. The gluten flour has to look like glue to make gluten bread. Being a glittering, glamorous model makes me glad. I almost came unglued when I glanced up and saw the glucose. The gleeful children glanced through the glass. We glided across the glittering snow gleefully. We were glaring at the glowing, glittering blazes. She glanced at the glittering, glossy diamond. The glee club gladly sang songs of glory. As I glanced around, I saw gleaming glaciers. Gloria glides gracefully across glittering ice. We would gladly stare at the glamorous model with glasses. Glittering jewelry is often made of glass and glue. Glenn and Gloria glanced at gliders and gladiators. That glamorous girl had a glassy stare, or excuse me, let me say that again. That glamorous girl had a glassy glare. Glow worms gleam and glisten when it's gloomy. All right, almost done with drills. My last drill here is going to focus on do and did. It's one of my most famous, or favorite, I should say, drills because I think it's such a common error that we make, you know, and it's hard to decipher if you read a sentence if, if it really is do or did. All right, so here we go. Did he go? Do you work? Did she try? Do you sleep? Did she arrive? Do you drink? Did he work? Do the men vote? Did you go? Do we have time? Did you sleep? Do the men agree? Did she tell you? Do you want to stay? Did she see you? Do they have a bar? Did he want to go? Do you have time? Did you see the car? Do they play, 
excuse me, do they pay monthly? Did the show get out? Did the pain continue? Do they open at 10? Did she have children? Do you have any money? Did you see the show? Do your brakes work? Do the signals work? Did he take a drink? Do you see the dog? Did the tire leave marks? Do you have any paper? Did your eyes bother you? Do the problems or programs begin now? Did the company merge? Did the plane leave? Do you have a license? Do the cars appear the same? Did the car hit you? Do you have any pain? Did they have supplies? Do you have the time? Did she come to the house? Do you think it will be all right? Did you have an examination? Right. And that's one of my favorite drills there, just because of the amount of errors we usually make with do and did. I know that was a, an issue for me for a while until I really focused on practicing those. All right, so we're going to move right in now to some literary and jury charge. All right, I've got, um, we're gonna start off with accident investigation. All right, I'm going to read this one time at uh, 120, and then I'll read it again at 140, and then again at 160, okay? All right, here we go, ready? I was assigned to the accident in question on March 17, when I got to the place where it had happened, I noticed skid marks that extended for some distance, and then I saw what happened to be gouge marks. I noticed that the gouge marks were approximately 315 feet away from the curb and at the curb itself. We measured them at the time, but I don't recall their length or anything. They appeared to be very fresh and they were over toward the right hand side of the street. In other words, it would be in the area that would be traveled by traffic that was going west. The gouge marks at the curb were actually areas where small pieces of concrete had been gouged out of the top portion of the curb. It is my opinion that these gouge marks were caused by areas where the vehicle struck the surface of the roadway and then hit the curb. The vehicle was totally demolished. The front of the vehicle had taken a very large impact, a very strong impact. It appeared as if the vehicle had gone off the cliff on its nose and then rolled over on its top. The top of the vehicle was totally demolished. The final impact, I believe, was in the area of about 100 feet from the base of the cliff, and then the truck vehicle struck and flipped over from there. So it was approximately 100 or 120 feet. The car was going at a very high rate of speed. As I recall, the vehicle did not touch the ground or the dirt area or make any tire prints within that area, which was a distance of approximately 20 feet. Before going over the cliff, the fact that it went through a secure barrier made the cable or let me say that again, made of steel cable and posts, would also indicate that it was going at a very high rate of speed before it went 
off the road, it is my opinion that the excessive speed was the primary cause of this accident and the resulting damages. All right, so I'm going to read that again at 1.40, okay? Here we go. I was assigned to the accident investigation in question on March 17. When I got to the place where it had happened, I noticed skid marks that extended for some distance, and then I saw what appeared to be gouge marks. I noticed that the gouge marks were approximately 315 feet away from the curb and at the curb itself. We measured them at the time, but I don't recall their length or anything. They appear to be very fresh and they were over toward the right hand side of the street. In other words, it would be in the area that would be traveled by traffic that was going west. The gouge marks at the curb were actually areas where small pieces of concrete had been gouged out of the top portion of the curb. It is my opinion that these gouge marks were caused by areas where the vehicle struck the surface of the roadway and then hit the curb. The vehicle was totally demolished. The front of the vehicle had taken a very large impact, a very strong impact. It appeared as if the vehicle had gone off the cliff on its nose and then rolled over on its top. The top of the vehicle was totally demolished. The final impact, I believe, was in the area of about 100 feet from the base of the cliff and then the vehicle struck and flipped over from there. So it was approximately 100 or 120 feet. The car was going at a very high rate of speed. As I recall, the vehicle did not touch the ground or the dirt area or make any tire prints within that area, which was a distance of approximately 20 feet before going over the cliff. The fact that it went through a secure barrier made of steel cable and posts would also indicate that it was going at a very high rate of speed before it went off the road. It is my opinion that the excessive speed was the primary cause of this accident and the resulting damages. All right, so the last time at 160. Okay, here we go. I was assigned to the accident in question on March 17. When I got to the place where it had happened, I noticed skid marks that extended for some distance, and then I saw what appeared to be gouge marks. I noticed that the gouge marks were approximately 315 feet away from the curb, and at the curb itself, we measured them at the time, but I don't recall their length or anything. They appear to be very fresh, and they were over toward the right-hand side of the street. In other words, it would be in the area that would be traveled by traffic that was going west. The gouge marks at the curb were actually areas where small pieces of concrete had been gouged out of the top portion of the curb. It is my opinion that these gouge marks were caused by areas where the vehicle struck the surface of the roadway and then hit the curb. The vehicle was totally demolished. The front of the vehicle had taken a very large impact, a very strong impact. It appeared as if the vehicle had gone off the cliff on its nose and then rolled over on its top. The top of the vehicle was totally demolished. The final impact, I believe, was in the area of about 100 feet from the base of the cliff, and then the vehicle struck and flipped over from there. So it was approximately 100 or 120 feet. The car was going at a very high rate of speed. 
as I recall, the vehicle did not touch the ground or the dirt area or make any tire prints within that area, which was a distance of approximately 20 feet before going over the cliff. The fact that it went through a secure barrier made of steel cable and posts would also indicate that it was going at a very high rate of speed before it went off the road. It is my opinion that the excessive speed was the primary cause of this accident and the resulting damages. All right, so hopefully it got easier each time, even though we, you know, we're gaining speed, hopefully it got a little bit easier there. All right, now I'm going to read to you some closing arguments for just a few minutes before we start Q&A. And I'm going to start this time at uh, 120, then work into 140, and then again at 160. Okay, so it'll just be a gradual thing instead of like repeating, okay? All right, and, and if you guys want, I can even like hold my hand up to let you guys know, okay, now I'm going to 140, now I'm going to 160, would you like that? Or just kind of move in, yeah? Nah? Okay. I'll just move right in. You'll probably notice. So, all right, here we go. I know that's a bummer thing about being, un, you know, muted is can't hear feedback. So, all right, here we go. No motive was ever introduced in this case. There is no reason given by Mr. Hunt because he hadn't thought that far. He didn't think he would be asked that question. Why in the world would you be in the back of the motel late at night, debris all around, just strolling there with Mr. McKinnon? Why, Mr. Hunt? Well, for no reason. Why in the world would two men be doing that at that point? There is no reason. That was the answer because it never happened. No one else saw Orlando Hunt at the back of the motel. Carrie Don Scott says, I didn't see him. You look at the diagram that Mr. Davis had all the witnesses positioning themselves on. You look at that diagram. You look how close Carrie Don Scott and Orlando Hunt would be at the time of the shooting, they would be looking into each other's eyes at the time of the shooting. If they were there, neither guys say he saw the other guy. Orlando Hunt got the details wrong. Orlando Hunt is the guy who says the gun is black. Remember, Carrie Don Scott says, the gun is silver and chrome. Orlando Hunt got the details wrong. Orlando Hunt is the guy who says that Cran Crandall McKinnon pointed the gun straight up and down. Carrie Don Scott is the guy that says, no, no, did it in a special way. We call it gangster style, where you twist it to the side. That's exactly what he said. Orlando Hunt is the guy who said he saw no one in the field, not Carrie Don Scott, not Gina Lee, not Chester Norwood. Hunt said he ran north and then west to Hathaway to his mother's house. If he did that, if he did that, he would have run right up the back of Chester Norwood and Gina Lee as they're going to the same direction. Orlando Hunt was the guy who said that he did not know if Gina Lee was a user of crack cocaine in January of 2014. Now think about that. A small lie? Think about that. Orlando Hunt is the man who said, Gina Lee, I don't know if she is a user of crack cocaine. I don't know. I've never seen her that way. 
on the 4th of January, she seemed normal to me. She didn't seem high to me. That's what he said. It's in the transcript. It's in your notes. Well, that's crazy. They had a child together. They knew each other for years. Everyone else in the world knew that Gina Lee was a terrible crack cocaine user. Gina Lee herself said she was a terrible crack cocaine user. She wasn't even shy about it. She said, I've been using crack cocaine 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years before and after. But Orlando Hunt swore to you that he did not know that she used crack cocaine. Ladies and gentlemen, he lied right in front of you. Orlando Hunt was also the guy who said that he did not talk to Gina Lee, and he said he was the guy that had no control over Gina Lee. Remember that? He had no control over Gina Lee. Oh, I do because of the child, just because regarding that child, but not in any other way. I have no control over her. He swore to you also, he swore to you that he did not discuss his control with, over Gina Lee with Mr. Davis and Mr. Buchanan. Remember he swore that to you, but you heard it on the tape. You heard it on the tape. Mr. Davis, do you have any control over Gina now? Does she like listen to you? Yes, he said, because she's being real hard ass with me. Oh, yes, he said. Don't worry about it. Now listen to this. Can you give her the word? He said, yes. You could do, I'm going to let her know, he said. Okay. Know how to get in touch with her? I want to interview her. Hunt says, yes. Davis, next page. Can you get word to her somehow? His answer was yes. I don't want to mess with her if she cooperates with me. If she doesn't cooperate with me, I'll just grab her down there and she can lie. She hasn't been cooperative so far. Hunt said, I will. So he was asked, you will talk to her? And he said, yes. And Mr. Davis says, I need to interview Gina Lee to have her come clean and say, yes, I was lying on the prelim and because I was scared and I was trying to support and whatever, whatever her trip was. So for Hunt to come in here and say he had no control over her, that it was never discussed, it is a lie. And what do you think that word meant? Word, give her the word. Orlando Hunt is also the guy that lied and boastfully told us that he lied to the defense investigator and also a small lie, but another one. He said that Crandall McKinnon the next day just appeared in his room. He was sleeping at two or three in the afternoon and all of a sudden Crandall McKinnon was at his doorway, no children, no wife, let him in, they didn't see him, but all of a sudden he's just standing at his doorway, threatening him, that makes no sense. It's unbelievable. It did not happen, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So I started at 120, went to 140, and then again at 160, okay. All right, so now I've got a strict Q&A, and it's a uh, plaintiff will be questioning, and this is just one page, so it's kind of nice because I can run through it once at 120, then again at 140, and then again at 160. So let me give you a word list. You're gonna hear children, defendant, counsel. Uh, let's see here. You're going to hear approximately at the time, evening, husband, which is just H-U-S. Oh, son-in-law, I like to use S-O-N-L for son-in-law. Um, 
do you see? You can phrase that, D-O-U-Z. Now you're gonna hear, did you see? And you have to decide if you wanna phrase, did you see or does? That's how we write does, so it's up to you. All right, so this is just strict Q&A. We'll start at one, uh, 120. All right, here we go. What was his name? Philip Sutherland. How old a man was he? He was 47, I think. Did you see your husband on the evening of November 21? Yes, I did. And was that at your home? Yes. About what time of the evening was it when you first saw your husband? Approximately 5.30 or 6. Was there anyone else at home with you at the time that you first saw your husband? Yes. Who else was there? My children. How many would that be? Two. Two children? Yes. Now I call your attention to the defendant, Richard Thomas, who is seated here at the far end of the council table. Do you see him over there? Yes. Do you know him? Yes. In what way do you know him? He is my son-in-law. Was the defendant at your home that evening? Yes. About what time did you first see him? I saw him for the first time the early part of the evening before I saw Mr. Sutherland. Did you see the two of them there at your home together? Yes. What time was that? Approximately 5.30 or 6 o'clock. All right, so now we'll do it again at 1.40. What was his name? Philip Sutherland. How old a man was he? He was 47, I think. Did you see your husband on the evening of November 21? Yes, I did. And was that at your home? Yes. About what time of the evening was it when you first saw your husband? Approximately 5.30 or 6. Was there anyone else at home with you at the time that you first saw your husband? Yes. Who else was there? My children. How many would that be? Two. Two children? Yes. Now I call your attention to the defendant, Richard Thomas, who is seated here at the far end of the council table. Do you see him over there? Yes. Do you know him? Yes. In what way do you know him? He is my son-in-law. Was the defendant at your home that evening? Yes. About what time did you first see him? I saw him for the first time the early part of the evening before I saw Mr. Sutherland. Did you see the two of them there at your home together? Yes. What time was that? Approximately 5.30 or 6 o'clock. All right, so the last time at 1.60. What was his name? Philip Sutherland. How old a man was he? He was 47, I think. Did you see your husband on the evening of November 21? Yes, I did. And was that at your home? Yes. About what time of the evening was it when you first saw your husband? Approximately 5.30 or 6. Was there anyone else at home with you at the time that you first saw your husband? Yes. Who else was there? My children. How many would that be? Two. Two children? Yes. Now I call your attention to the defendant, Richard Thomas, who is seated here at the far end of the council table. Do you see him over there? Yes. Do you know him? Yes. In what way do you know him? 
he is my son-in-law. Was the defendant at your home that evening? Yes. About what time did you first see him? I saw him for the first time, the early part of the evening before I saw Mr. Sutherland. Did you see the two of them there at your home together? Yes. What time was that? Approximately 5.30 or 6 o'clock. Right. Now I'm going to give you some Q&A that, um, let's see here, it looks like defense is questioning. And this time I'm gonna start at 120, go right into 140, and then again at 160, just kind of move right in instead of stopping and redoing each one. Okay, all right, here we go. Did you have to travel frequently in your job? Well, I would like you to define what you mean and then I will answer the question, how often do you leave home in a period of a month? I would say I would be gone once a week. You would leave home once a week? Yes. Do you mean one day a week? Would you go for any period of time extending beyond one day? I have not taken all my trips and averaged them out. If I had to do that, they would average out to one trip a week, which would encompass leaving in the morning of one day, staying overnight, and returning home the next afternoon. Have you ever made trips that extended for a period of four to five days? Yes, I have. How frequently has this happened where you would be gone for a period of four or five days? In my present employment, it has happened twice. In my previous employment, I really can't remember, but I would say it probably happened at least six times. Is that aside from your one day a week or two days a week? No, these would be similar type trips, but it required my staying for longer periods. How long a period did you stay in those instances? You mean in my previous employment? or in your present employment. I have already told you, how long were those days or stays? An average stay would be leaving the morning of one day and staying overnight. You mentioned there were two of them that you stayed for a longer period of time. Oh yes, on one trip in the earlier part of June, I left on Wednesday and returned Tuesday afternoon. This was a planned trip where my wife accompanied me to Seattle. The other occasion was the week of August 16 and I was gone Tuesday through Friday. Those are the two occasions. This week you were away also, weren't you, from Tuesday until Friday? That is correct. I was gone two nights. You left Tuesday night and you came back when? Last night? I came back last night. Is this a necessary part of your employment? It is. Absolutely necessary? Absolutely. This will be an integral, integral part of your employment for the future. My taking trips on this job will be an important part of this job. Are you intending to stay on this job? Yes. So you anticipate frequent absences from home, whether it be for one day, two days, or possibly four or five days. I expect that I will have to go on trips. Have you considered the possibility of transferring out of the state of Pennsylvania? I have thought several times about that, and I have discussed it with my wife, and the conversations have always been about 
going to Denver. Have you ever stated to her that you have a possibility of transferring your position to Washington, D.C.? I made a statement which she has construed the way you have put it. I told her that a friend was accepting a job in Houston and that I also knew that a job was available in Washington. I said I wouldn't be surprised if maybe my name would come up in the junction with that job. If it did, would you consider it? That job has already been filled and my name was not on the list of those considered. Were those trips that you have taken strictly business? Yes, they were strictly business. Have you had any social activities during these trips that you have taken? Yes, I took customers out to dinner and to shows. Have you had any dates with any other women during these trips? No, never. All right, so I'm going to give you guys some four voice. <clears throat> this is going to start with defense. Again, I'm going to start at 120 and work my way up to 160. Okay, here we go. So you are talking about being with friends at this point, right? Yes. Now you go into the house and your testimony was that you watch TV. Is that correct? Yes. And this was an apartment, excuse me, rather than a house, but it was an apartment. And where were you sitting? On the couch. Okay, and I believe your testimony was Scott and Bobby were sitting on the couch too. Is that correct? Yes. Were you in the middle? No. Where were you sitting? There were two different couches. Okay, who was sitting on which couch? Me and Bobby was sitting on one and Scott was sitting on the one right beside. By himself? Uh-huh. Now, were you sitting close to Bobby, like he had his arm around you, didn't he? No. Did you have your arm around him? No. Did you have your hand on him? No. Your arm? No. You were just sitting away from him or right next to him? Just next to him. Okay, now this was about what? the third or fourth date you'd been on? Yes. And had you ever taken a drive before with Bobby? Yes. And do you recall what you were watching that night? No. Do you recall anything like it being a news program or a talk show or anything like that? No. You don't remember anything at all about the TV program? No. Was there a movie on? I am not sure what it was. Okay, how long did you watch TV? Around 30 minutes to an hour. Okay, now would that have been about 1230 when you stopped watching TV? I am not sure. Was it getting pretty late? Yes, but you didn't have a curfew or any reason to get back home, did you? No. And did you call your mother or somebody to tell them where you were? No. Did you use your cell phone? No. Did you feel that you could not use your cell phone? No. You felt comfortable, right? Yes. Okay, now at some point, Scott tells you, you can go into the bedroom, right? Yes. Why did he do that? Do you know? Because I was dozing off. Your Honor, I have nothing further. Counsel? Thank you. Were you dozing off and sleeping on Bobby's shoulder? No. So were you asleep on the couch? Not really asleep. Okay, just dozing off. Was Bobby? No. Were they talking, Scott and Bobby? No. Everyone was just watching TV? Yes. Did you have anything to drink at that point? 
No. Did Scott? No. No beer or anything? No. Did you walk around the apartment, like go into the kitchen or anything like that? No. So when you went into the bedroom, who directed you to the bedroom? Scott. Who did? Scott. Now, were you wearing a coat when you went into the bedroom? Yes. Okay, and you were wearing jeans? Yes. And you had planned on going to the dance club earlier, and you were dressed to go to a dance club, is that correct? Yes. And what kind of coat was it you were wearing? A blue and brown coat. A what? Blue and brown coat. Was this the kind of fabric that wrinkled easily? No. So when you got to the bed, you had the coat on? Yes. And you fell asleep? Yes. Nothing further. Counsel? Thank you. Now you testified that at some point you heard, oh, by the way, you left the door open to the room. Is that correct? Yes. And you did actually fall asleep? Yes. Okay, now you testified at some point that you heard someone come in. Uh-huh, right? Yes. And who was it that came into the room? Bobby. Okay, and you say that you heard Bobby unbuckle his pants. Is that true? Yes. And then he got on the bed with you? Yes. Okay, you knew when he got in the bed with you that he didn't have pants on. Is that correct? Yes. Did you see that? No. How did you know he didn't have his pants on? Because I heard his pants drop and I heard him take them off. Okay, and then he gets into bed with you. And by in the bed, you mean on the bed because at this point, <clears throat> you weren't under the covers. Is that right? No. Now, did you get off the bed at that point? No. The district attorney asked you if you were worried about something. Were you at that point? No. Did you like Bobby getting into the bed with his pants off? It wasn't no big deal. I wasn't undressed. Okay, now it wasn't any big deal. What did you then do next? You didn't leave the bed, did you? No. You didn't get up. Did you say anything to Bobby about maybe leaving the room or something? No, you just did what? Lay there? Yes, and went back to sleep? No, what did you do? He asked me to take off my jacket and pants. What did you do? I took them off. Why? Because I didn't want to argue. What was? I was tired. I'm sorry, what? I was tired. I didn't understand that. Can you say that again? I was tired. You were tired. Okay, continue. Now, what did you do with your clothing? I set them on the side of the bed. You didn't throw them on the floor? On the floor, on the side of the bed. Did Bobby threaten you if you didn't take off your clothes? No. Did he order you to take them off? Not exactly, no. Okay, did you voluntarily take them off? What do you mean voluntarily? Did you take them off yourself? Yes. And you set them on the bed, on the floor. On the floor? On the side of the bed. On the side of the bed. Okay, thank you. All right, so started at 120, went to 140, and uh, spent quite a bit of time at 160. I spent more time, I would say, than in any of the other two speeds at 160. So um, let's see here. You know what, you guys? Let's end with one more thing. We've got just a few more minutes. I like this one because it's um, an easier Q&A. It focuses on, is that right? Is that correct? That's right. That's correct. Um, yeah, that's what this focus is on, so I like it. Um, and I'm going to read this at 160 since you guys are really warmed up, okay? All right, this is defense again. Here we go, ready? 
You filled out a report, is that right? That's right. This was gone over by James Marshall in your presence, is that correct? That's right. Did he bring your attention to any specific areas of the report? Correct. What did he bring your attention to, if you recall? Well, he said that the date and time of the incident couldn't be correct because Rick Jones was off on that day. Now you still feel that your report is correct, don't you? That's correct. And why is that? Well, it happened on October 15. That day was a payday for us, so Rick would have come in. So the idea that Rick wasn't there that day is wrong? That is correct. Now, according to your report, you were working in room 14. Is that right? That's right. You heard Rick's voice as he was walking into the room? Right. You said that he was walking, excuse me, talking to someone. Do you know who that was? Mike Brenner. And he was present for the assault? That's correct. And you claim that you were struck with a board? That's right. Four times? That is right. All right. Would you guys like me to read it one more time? It's up to you. Do you feel like you got a good workout? Yeah? All right. Here, let me unmute you guys. Can you? Hello. Hi. Um, how was that? How was the last one? It was good. Um, short, so you could do it again if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay. I'll just leave you guys unmuted. All right. I'll read this again at 160, okay? Here we go. You filled out a report, is that right? That's right. This was gone over by James Marshall in your presence, is that correct? That's right. Did he bring your attention to any specific areas of the report? Correct. What did he bring your attention to, if you recall? Well, he said that the date and time of the incident couldn't be correct because Rick Jones was off on that day. Now you still feel that your report is correct, don't you? That's correct. And why is that? Well, it happened on October 15. That day was a payday for us, so Rick would have come in. So the idea that Rick wasn't there that day is wrong? That is correct. Now, according to your report, you were working in room 14, is that right? That's right. You heard Rick's voice as he was walking into the room, right? You said that he was talking to someone. Do you know who that was? Mike Brenner. And he was present for the assault? That's correct. And you claim that you were struck with a board? That's right. Four times? That is right. Now, would you guys, I know that we are at 10. Do you guys want me to read this back to you just to see how you did? Back. Yeah, you want to do that? Back. Okay, I'll read it back so you guys can follow along and, or you guys can, you know, well, we probably don't have time for read back, but I'll read it back and you can see how you did, okay? So question, you filled out a report, is that right? Answer, that's right. Question, this was gone over by James Marshall in your presence, is that correct? Answer, that's right. Question, did he bring your attention to any specific areas of the report? Answer, correct. Question, what did he bring your attention to, if you recall? Answer, well, he said that the date and time of the incident couldn't be correct because Rick Jones was off on that day. Question, now, you still feel that your report is correct, don't you? Answer, that's correct. Question, and why is that? Answer, well, it happened on October 15. That day was a payday for us, so Rick would have come in. Question, so the idea that Rick wasn't there that day is wrong? Answer, that's, I'm sorry, that is correct. Question, now, according to your report, you were working in room 14, is that right? 
Answer, that's right. Question, you heard Rick's voice as he was walking into the room? Answer, right. Question, you said that he was talking to someone. Do you know who that was? Answer, Mike Brenner. Question, and he was present for the assault? Answer, that's correct. Question, and you claim that you were struck with a board? Answer, that's right. Question, four times? Answer, that is right. How'd you do? Good. Awesome. So if you guys are on the end tail of this, like you're, you're more on the 160 side, I really encourage you to watch, even if you can't attend the live class, but at least watch the recorded uh, class that we have on Fridays <clears throat> from 9 to 10. Um, once it's, you know, if you can't attend the live um, and just push. Um, even if you have to drop words, it's okay. And then if we have read back, then you can just say, hey, I'm, I'm pushing this class and I'll know to skip over you. Okay, so really, especially if you're in the 160, you're going to need to start pushing 180. And, uh, and uh, even when we get to 200, 225, you just drop in, you know, write what you can and drop what you have to. And it'll make your speed seem so much slower. Okay. I think pushing is just as important as uh, trailing. I really do. When I was um, going to school, and I, I think it was about 120, I really started pushing. And I, that's when I started moving quickly through classes. So um, you guys have any questions about any of the briefs or any of the material? No? There was one that kept coming up in that car accident one. Oh, demolished. I wanted to, I was trying to figure out one on the fly for demolished. I think I, I was thinking DMSH or I think I did. Yeah, that. I know. I was just thinking that. I wonder if you could like squeeze it. Yeah, like, I did. That's what I did. Yeah, like DM. Um, <laughs> when it, there was a mess, I knew it was demolished. Yeah, I wonder if you could do like D-M-I-S-H, like yeah. fish, you know? I, I think I did D-M-O-S-H or something. I just did a, yeah, something with Yeah. What, Adam, what did you say you used? I did the D-M-I-S-H. Okay, yeah, yeah, D-M-I-S-H. I think I've seen that somewhere. I write that out, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right, well... I'm so happy that you guys are here with me in the live class. It's so much fun to actually see faces. Yeah, it's good to be, be back. Yes, thank you. All right, well, if you have any questions, send me an email. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll see you start seeing you soon um, on the Friday classes. If not, watch the recorded and just push what you can, you know? All right, you guys. Have a great day. Okay, bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye, Robin. Bye, Donna. Bye, bye. Adam. Bye.